its consequences. And I'll take you through some few stories and then maybe 20 minutes out of if you want to take it, okay? And I'll be um, on the clock with you, okay? You'll be out of here by noon. But this is something dear to my heart. So one of the motivations for me in studying this kind of stuff as a profession is the idea the path to appreciate civilization is also to watch where it collapses, right? This is the idea. You may go over a bridge, the Ambassador Bridge, over to Canada sometime from Detroit. But of course, it is when that bridge falls apart that you fully realize and appreciate what that bridge was. So my research area, along with others in the world, is when things go very, very bad. Xenophobia is part of that. But let me take you right away into something that's opposite number. Xenophilia. Let's talk about this idea of rejecting one's own familiar culture and falling in love with the far. Maybe some of you know such people out there, and I'm not standing in front of the screen. No one can see it anyhow, so big deal. But, uh, and let me just go for about on a 15, 20-minute rant, okay? So xenophilia, I'm born witness to it. Let me tell you a story about wonderful bright Sarah years ago in China. It's 1970. First wave of Americans. Um, Sarah, uh, coming out of Temple, hated her own culture. She adopted the Mao suit and only spoke Chinese and rejected all things about Philly, wonderful city of brotherly love. The Eagles rejected America and tried to adopt that. And of course, in trying to fit in, I remember this one well, this is just a story when we tried to be who we're not. Uh, the Chinese would walk around, what's this crazy Waigou Ren? I speak some Chinese. I speak Chinese. So, uh, so what's this crazy foreigner trying to be just like us for? So that's xenophilia, right? A rejection of where we come from. But let's go to xenophobia, right? This, so let's work at the margins, the far not margins of what we're talking about. Full rejection of what's familiar to us and an adaptation. Like, uh, I'm going to be Japanese. Well, I don't think you're going to be Japanese, but you could think that, right? From an a, a, a aspirational identity standpoint. Xenophobia, of course, may be a little more dangerous than xenophobia. Xenophilia? Xenophilia has its own dangers to it because all of a sudden you're not involved in your local community and you, I mean, this idea we all come from somewhere and we all start with the familiar around us, but that xenophobia. So some interesting stuff, and I do make a profession of studying this, so some numbers coming at you. The numbers for me, 13 years abroad, three wars, four arrests now, right? No tortures. Well, one small torture, but, uh, and uh, of course, lots of anecdotal stuff that um, got me involved in the academic side of this years ago. So, uh, but uh, the other side of the coin, I, I'm still in the trades. I work and build. That means I hang out with a lot of working class folks. Fine. And never to disparage where I came from. Working class guy from the upper peninsula of Michigan. I know some of my far family members. I know some of them in my clan. Maybe you know, know some too. You're sitting around the Thanksgiving table or whatever. And you find this, that so xenophobia in its definition, very simple kind of definition, an irrational fear. We want to focus on this idea of the irrational fear of foreigner, as opposed to a rational fear of the outside, right? So we see that, right, a rational fear, uh, COVID, right, or smallpox, or, you know, polio, rational fear, scurvy, a rational fear, right, that, oh, I don't want to get that, how do I, if I come into contact, this, maybe I get this, so I want to keep you at a distance. So we think of the irrational components, then we can think, of course, the metrics of xenophobia, so we can look at people in the world, and I want to take you on a little bit around the world. This is not an American phenomena. This is a human phenomena. Please, go ahead. Why would me, like, if I, just your example, like, if mm. I was afraid of getting COVID, why mm. would that be irrational? It's something that's, like... Not irrational. A rational okay. fear. So, I, I'm sorry if you misheard me. So, there are rational fears in the world, and then this idea of an attribution of irrational fears. That is, like, if you make an inquiry about why you fear what you do, and, and this speaks to that other side of the coin, as opposed to xenophilia, falling in love and distancing yourself from your own culture, which happens in the world, and this idea of xenophobia, is that, so what constitutes? And so let's take into big picture tough stuff and small picture stuff. So we think of something like the Holocaust iconic, right? So this kind of stuff, most of you are familiar with the Holocaust. So most Germans who 
came into buying into a Hitler xenophobic ideology which led to that severe anti-Semitism in Germany back in the 1930s. Never knew a Jew. Jews were concentrated in small numbers in Berlin and Hamburg. Yet the people who became, and here we get into some biases, and this is tricky stuff, right? I mean, it's complex. We want to understand the complexity of this, is that people bought into visions and identity politics in the world that allowed those irrational fears to fit into a logic of systems which gave them power. So this is what I look at in the world, not just the relationship of one person's disposition to fearing whether it's immigration here, and we want to hop around the world in this because we could focus on our own society, fine, but let's play in the world too. Good to remember, 4% of the world's population lives in this country. 96 does not. Let's go look at that other 96, see what they're up to too, see what they can tell us about ourselves. So back to that idea of irrational fear versus irrational fear, uh, we can think about that when we do an inquiry into xenophobia in its worst manifestations, we find that it's simply buy-in into an ideology with no measurable threat. So a measurable threat might be, so you're going to take my job. That might be a rational fear, right? You're showing up at my borders and you're going to take my job. So we can go in then into the logic and empiricism around what constitutes a threat, thus having rational fear of the outside. So I want to take you out into the world around this for a little bit. So if I say here comes an immigrant community that looks just like me, but they have another national origin, and I feel like they're taking my jobs, maybe I go and burn down their shops and start to beat their people. This is my work, for instance, part of our work. This is South Africa and Zimbabwe. This is not America. That's not uh, this idea of what's happening in Sweden. So the thread of xenophobia can be found everywhere. It can be found everywhere. And it can be based in, and we have a beautiful eclectic group here. I hope you uh, hold me accountable for what I'm talking about here because it's coming at you fast and furious. But there's a thread of maybe dispositions and there's great literature on this about the confusion. Is the fear of the unknown a intrinsic disposition or is it something culturally taught? So it, maybe some of you are looking at this. I look at it fairly closely. We don't know. We don't know. And this takes us back to if you put a bunch of five years old five-year-olds together, they fear anything, or three-year-olds. So that starts around the world. But but we can look at it and my, my research area is where the tendency, and, and I will tell you straight up, unhesitatingly, as a 70-year-old guy, we live in those threats prominently in the world now. So we find the sanctioning, that means the giving life systematically to what I would say we don't want to stand for as a university and hopefully what we don't want to stand for as a civilized society. And that is the dehumanization and the marginalization of others. And that other has a curious phenomena. So you wouldn't think that a Zimbabwean in South Africa would be seen as the other. I was in Rwanda during genocide time. If I have any Central Africans here, so I'm a Burundi, Rwanda, Congo guy. And so the other right, that notion of differentiation that can be a root ideology, make me make sense with any terms here, is that that can become part of a belief system that is rational or irrational. That takes some questions, right? So the irrationality, there is a, what I'd say, a superficial understanding of fears of the unknown, which is an attribution to, like, you should get along with everybody. Well, now we have a problem, right? Do you, do you want to get along with everybody? Because maybe culture really matters. Let me be, because this is a sophisticated group, I'm sure. So let's think about what has happened right down the street in Detroit historically. If anybody knows, does everybody know what FGM is? FGM, female genital mutilation. 
So it's a fairly common practice throughout North Africa in particular, but no, no big deal, it's, it's happened. But of course, when these things become transplanted, so the idea this can become problematic. So we had, it's historic cases over in Detroit and some other areas related to immigration and movement of peoples. There are 8.2 billion people in the world. Most of them, right, stay home. Most of them don't leave. But there are about, what, 39 million refugees in the world now and hundreds of millions of people moving. And then we think about that idea of the contact point, right? And what constitutes between any particular story in a contact point and threat versus and a rational sense of what that means to me. So let me go with the story. I am in Nepal not too long ago, and I have a young friend who's a human rights activist in Nepal. So part of my work is looking in China, I'm just coming from there, by the way, with human trafficking. Very going to be straightforward, quick with you. This is the selling of 13, 14-year-old girls from Nepal, India, uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, into the Chinese uh, marriage market. That's for other reasons. We can explain that, but that happens. Falling point is Hong Kong. But I'm in Nepal, and... Uh, I, Yagan is his name, Yagan, great guy, and know him. And he says, I cannot come into his house. Why? Well, there's, this is a rural house. It's actually a great name. It's Tin Pippo, little suburb of Poker in Nepal. But there's a, uh, a um, nice uh, fence, stone fence around uh, the farm. My father will not let you in. Why? Because you're a contaminated, unorthodox Hindu. So I am seen as a disease. So we want to think about, at that point, I bow down to Yagyan, I get it, I'm going to sleep with the cows. So I slept with the water buffaloes, no big deal. So that's fine with me. So the idea, though, also is this, is that Yagyan's father, I, I get it, that's a disposition, you know, you're going to bring in some kind of toxic poison. So that's happened to me in the world and maybe it's happened to you at different, this is a stuff of, you know, kindred racism and discrimination and, and what you or I might call irrational fears, but POV, right, point of view. Like to Yegyan's father, no, I am bringing something from a belief system standpoint. And I tell him, you want me to convert? And he says, no, no, it's fine. <laughs> but, but no, you're just not invited in. You can't even come into the front gates. So this is not to disparage traditional Orthodox Hindu culture, but to know that cultures matter and belief systems matter. And now we get into the tough stuff. If any of you are familiar with this historic arc, this is clash of civilization stuff. And you're in that world. This is where not just the empirical side of you being a threat to me, that you're going to take my job, that you're going to make me not practice my religion, because that's the stuff of power, right? But we're talking about belief systems that you cannot find the why, other than I believe that, other than, um, and, and let's go to this location right now, we can find it very close by, even sometimes on campus. Uh, close the borders, I hate foreigners. And you go, why? Uh, they take all our jobs. And you go, well, do they? Do they take all our jobs? No different than Yegan's father in that little village outside Poker in Nepal, gorgeous in the Annapurna Range, sees me as I'm carrying some kind of disease that I don't know I carry. And maybe I do, maybe it's boisterousness or whatever, but, 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 but the point is, is that I just want to give that impression that we're in a slippery slope to complexity when we make the tensions in the world strictly about irrational fears. Because it does not look irrational to the folks that you and I do not want to be in power. That looks rational to them. So now we're into the idea of not just my belief system, and this is where the rubber hits the road, right, is what is my capacity to act on my irrational or even rational fears? Now we're into the power structures of this. Now you're into my research area. So I am not so concerned with the xenophobe at the end of the bar who says, kill all the, kill all the immigrants, you know, death to all the immigrants. What, this can happen everywhere in the world by the way, from South Africa to China, mostly I'm a China guy. Xenophobia is very powerful. Irrational fears in Japan, in China, in South Korea. It's here, 
but it's a human characteristic that maybe has an, maybe some epigenetics to it, maybe, but mostly it occurs within those social political systems that it gets sanctions. It gets made to be okay, right? So, and, and I can hop around the world with this kind of demonstration of this, is that, so we think of this arc of this big arc of, you know, rejecting one's culture kind of irrationally and said, there's nothing good about where I come from, something far away is great, to the idea of, well, there's some purity, some myth, and there's great studies, this, I'm not gonna bore you with the academic sides, but great research on this about buying into the myth of where we come from and the purity of ourselves, right? But it becomes the belief structure. But that is distinct from, let's go to some places right now. Let's go, I'm just coming from Ukraine. So here comes some tough stuff, right? So we wanna think about the Ukraine war resulted, let's talk about real world for a second, you, a flood of migrants, about four million coming out of Ukraine. So this is still ongoing to this day, but over the past three years. So that flood of migrants coming in, mostly into Poland, out of Ukraine, and I was with them, walked right with them. So here's tough stuff, right? So here's the flood of migrants coming in. Those who were white, those who practiced a similar Christian tradition, who spoke Ukrainian, were well received by the Poles. So firsthand, who do I see? There are about 80,000 Middle Eastern and African students studying in Ukraine in schools like this, in medical schools and engineering schools, separate line for them, separate line. They can't go on the same line. So this is this, I don't know if you're familiar with Benedict Anderson and Imagine Community stuff, but this has to do with the construction of belief systems translated into this notion that you're in this line, but you have to go in this line, and those then have very tangible consequences once you get sorted out into these lines. So the idea is that maybe you're going to see in your lives xenophobic tendencies, and I would always ask you to ask that next question, am I dealing with an irrational fear versus a rational fear? Because let me take you into Afghanistan. I've been to Afghanistan twice. And if you are making an attribution of a certain threat, maybe that threat is real, right? This is the stuff of war and genocide and bad things happening for instance, to women today, which is one of the great heartbreaks. I can get tearful over what has happened there. So that idea of femicide within the Afghani system today. So that's tough stuff. But this is all too real out there when we start to put those thoughts into the real world. So the idea of having some rational fear of ex-population with all the guns and money with real consequences speaks to our own history of slavery here. Right? We want to remember the fear. And, I, and I'm not going to soft pedal any of this. So much of that xenophobia when you get into it has to do with sexual relations also. So all kinds of threads deep into this about contaminations of bloodlines. Spare me if you the, you know the science of this. But politically, that becomes a huge play also. We see it right here. By the way, it was a Trump speech about two or three weeks ago. And that's a heartbreak for me to hear that language. Um, he just said it, I didn't make him say it, he said it, contamination of bloodlines. But that has a long thread historically about the idea that the language becomes important, the power structures become important to tap into the latency. And that latency, of course, makes us per curious creatures because one of the hard parts, let me take you back to this and then we're already at 25 minutes. I want to see where you guys want to go with this. And this is a kind of 50 years of study for me, so I go all over the map on it. But the idea that when I talk to someone who I would say has an irrational xenophobic fear of foreigners. And that starts with questioning. Do you know anyone? No, I do not know. Do you know any Hispanic people? No. I see you're driving a brand new F-150 truck and making like 80,000 bucks a year and life looks pretty good. Refrigerator is full, yeah. Yeah, high speed Wi-Fi, yeah. So where is the threat? Curious. So some of the data on this and then let me open it up. So we do survey research in this field, right? Wonder, work, curious, and attitudes. So I do not want to disparage uh, um, Idaho or Montana, but please allow me. <laughs> I love Montana, I love this country dearly. 
So Montana is more xenophobic in its homogeneity than places where there's huge interaction with other peoples that are very diverse, whether LA, the most diverse city in America today, by the way, is Houston, Texas. So on the metrics, rather amazing. Go Houston, curious place. So you would think it would be LA or New York or something, it's not. But we have to deal with that right here. So a little bit of sidebar of this in the weed stuff for me. So I'm part of our refugee resettlement community in Kalamazoo. My job is to find them housing, which is tough. But you have to understand very thoughtfully, this is a lot of people involved in the state, national. We do not announce where we locate our refugee populations. Why do we not, and why don't we bring some pride and say this? I think you know the answer. We fear the irrational response once we say here's a Syrian family here, here's an Afghani family here. We fear that somebody's gonna show up and start throwing rocks through their window or maybe start targeting them. So, so this is not just a global phenomenon of human beings doing this in the world. It's right next door to us. It's in my neighborhood, it's in your neighborhood. And of course, it knows no boundaries. So you would think, okay, some idyllic place, Iceland, Sweden, Norway, no, xenophobia fully there. All kinds of fears, right? Oh, Canada must have it right. No, no place has it right. Those tensions abound. Oh, if we only all were Christians, then this wouldn't happen. Oh, only if we were all black, it wouldn't happen. Only if we were all white. Those are the myths, absolutely verifiable myths to this. So we have to work ourselves and our political systems. Again, for me, and you know, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a, a neuroscientist, I pay attention to some of that literature. I am interested in where power is located. I'm interested in where the guns and the money are and how guns and money get to be part of the real consequences for people as a result of what we see is that xenophobia. So, and I'm not talking about abstractions here. Let me open up, see anybody want to take it any direction. I'm capable of tangential stuff. Any comments? I, I know Fast and Furious on you, but go. Okay, let me, yes, please. Okay. So yeah. Let me um, come on in. Get us talking about yeah. where these folks come from. Sure. Where we come from. You bet. We're in the College of Health and Human Services. Yeah. The reason we're in the College of Health and Human Services, right, is because all of these people said, "I want to help somebody," and so they can't have xenophobia. They can't be afraid of a particular group of people. And so that's why we have these lectures, these these lunch and learn series. Sure. Because this is about you've got to want to help everybody, no matter what their skin color is, mm -hmm. no matter where they come mm -hmm. from, you have to want to help everybody because that's the promise that you made. Or you can go into another program at Western like art or something, which is great, <laughs> which is great. <laughs> but you can't say, I want to be a nurse. Also well. Right, right. <laughs> you know, you can't say, I want to be a nurse, but I don't want to help you. Sure. And, and a little, little bit of follow-up Qu okay. quickly on it, just coming, well, go to Ukraine in the war. So I have some old mates who work with Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders. So I just, all I do is haul boxes for them because I'd love to have those skills, which you guys don't have, which I don't have. I mean, I'll take a bullet out of you and an arrow, but then I've got to get to you, to somebody who you know, who is good. <laughs> but, uh, but it's that very idea. They go in, but here's the tough stuff when you are prohibited from administering that. You find yourself, because we live in systems, those systems have rewards and punishments to them. And those rewards and punishment, you already know this, right? You already know this. But it's not going away. So we always want to be conscious of the invisibility of that world we live in, which has rules to it. So Doctors Without Borders breaks my heart as a former journalist. And we've lost about 80 journalists in Gaza over the last months. 80. People who just want to tell a story. Kindred profession, right? I'm just here to tell a story. I'm doing no harm. I'm just going to tell a story. I'm just here to heal the sick. And no because you will be in the mix. And that puts us in the systems of how other things are going on in power distributions in the world. I still love my work that way, but thank you for that. But let's see if anybody, we've got about only 25 minutes left already. Feel free, fire away. I've got stories in me. <laughs> stories illuminate bigger databases, so. But let's see if anybody wants to take it anywhere. 
or I will go on with the. Yes, please. Yes, and I, you know, for me, I am 70 year old guy, I'm clear on this. You want to know the systems you live in that allocate power, whether it's university police, presidents of universities, whether it's governors of states, this is t tangible stuff. Who's in power within our, you know, that old mantra, do what you can where you are with what you have. So I do not get to change the world and neither do you. We live in big picture stuff. Again, 206 countries, 8.2 billion people. Lots of good things going on, lots of tough stuff for us going on simultaneously. We didn't think, um, from a standpoint of early 90s, mid 90s, that we'd be in the position we, we are, but we are. Let me give you a specific example to follow up on that. So Poland, the recipient of many refugees recently out of Ukraine, in millions showing up, just several weeks ago had an election, and they rejected xenophobia in that election. It was hair's breadth, and they had to confront the right-wing politics. Now, you're in my world of, like, I want to see who can administer consequences and rewards in systems, right? Not just confront it from a consciousness standpoint, but who can do what to whom how. So Poland just did that rather amazing moment, you know, vote one vote. to me, very gratifying moment. Go Poland, you fought back. So how do we understand the systems we're in as opposed just thoughts and prayers, right? Fine, you know, and one to come to grips with our own situation around being Ir you know, irrationally xenophobic or having rational fears of things in the world. Uh, so, so I am the kid, for instance, who, a uh, little sidebar, I walked across Africa for a year, 1979, great year for me. Went to Egypt and just started walking south. And it was a great year, the stupid Mazungu, if there are any Swahili speakers here. So I just walked and walked, but when I came back, it was interesting for me. I, big year across to Africa, part of that, never regret those years. And I came back and people said, well, why didn't people kill you? Because you're a white guy. And I go, uh, you know, my problem, I carried a spoon with me. And I showed him a big spoon. I said, you know, my problem was eating too much because I was hosted so much. And it plays to those predispositions, right? So how to combat that of course, consciousness matters. How we think about things matters. But of course, from my disposition, I would say, if you want to fight back, vote correctly. Participate. Hold people in power accountable for their actions. If you do not think things can go south here, they can. They can go south anywhere. And that's a humbling thing for me to say because I don't want that to be true but it is true out in the world. Things can fall apart. And by falling apart as a student of genocide and gross human rights abuses, so this idea, we do, there's no inevitability about going forward with this. We can go backwards. And that backwards is full of what I'd call the brown shirt mentality, is I will let the irrational, unfounded fears of the world rule the day. And that ruling has very specific consequences. And for me, at its worst, that's where you and I don't control it. But that's where people start killing each other just based on their idea of who they are, as opposed to any knowledge about how to get out of that situation. So that is true in the world today, and that's where I'm coming from. That's, I mean, that's, it's good to feel it. You're welcome to come with me anytime. We'll see if we go to the largest refugee camp in the world. That's uh, Cox's Bazaar. That's Bangladesh this spring. You're welcome to come along and try to do good with 1.2 million Rohingya refugees. So do I make sense? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a tough nut. It's difficult. But I, I mean, of course, we always have to work on ourselves. But I'm also interested in, you know, as I say, classic, the guns and money <laughs> and what laws are and who get to enforce policies. And that speaks to our commitment to diversity inclusion, right? You know, how it's one thing to put those pretty words on paper. Very tough to go do the work. And anyone who's involved in this knows that that is tough sledding. So again, I don't have time to mince words about how hard this will be for all of you. But it's also fun.
human beings at work. Yes? Anybody else? We got about uh, 15 minutes or so left, 20 minutes. Come on. Yeah, please. Yes? Um, what do you do to combat when people are xenophobic towards you? Oh, man. When zen A, survive. <laughs> so it is true. I, I mean, I'm just going to facts of the matter. Pamela knows this. So I can laugh about it now. It wasn't funny at the moment. If somebody has an AK-47 in your ears and in your mouth, it is no time to combat xenophobia. Your hands are up and you're just going, I will do whatever you say because I want to live to fight another day. And then you can laugh about it many years later. So that's part of some of the wars I've been through. But, um, you know, so I'm glad I did it now. I'm glad I lived. So what do I do to combat xenophobia? One is gauging our audience. So who's in this room? I'm going to go high bar predisposition towards my message here. But if I'm at a rotary club, I'm doing the public speaking, I do, I'm in the mashed potato circuit, I'm going to try to understand where people are coming from, try to ask them questions. So if I'm with the Home Builders Association of Escanaba, Michigan, and I gather some of that, I'm going to have to make some judgments about, because I'm not interested in just having them me. I'm interested to so say, where do you see the threats? How are those threats manifested? And how do you, right, how do you see this? So this is, again, what we all know if you're, you are already in it because you're here today, by force, by the way. I, I understand you didn't have a choice, but some, but, <laughs> all right, so be it. Great. So I, I like to talk about it, so fine. But I mean, of course, we should gauge our audiences. But of course, there is also a time to take a stand. This becomes tough. Where do we then take stands and say, hey, I, I, I cannot work with you. So let me go to the complexity. Fair enough? So let's make things complex. I'm part of refugee relief work here in Kalamazoo. We have jobs for people. We have Syrian refugees coming. And we have jobs for them. But here's tough cultural stuff. I'm just going to say it. Our Syrian guys, when they came, they were rural Syrians who are here as refugees. They could not work with women. This was tough for us. We had a moment some years ago where our crews are mixed gender and some of our job site bosses are women. And now you got the complexity, right? The intersectionality of, you know, fears and ration and how do we work that? That does not have the great consequences of what we're talking about, but it's a thread and it's true. It becomes a data point in the sea of humanity that is true again, whether you're in South Africa or Korea or Japan or China or here in Kalamazoo, Michigan. So how do we navigate that takes a little bit of thoughtfulness, but of course we cannot navigate it without conversation and because it becomes negotiated. And then at some point, somebody's got some authority over somebody else and going to say, well, we don't hire refugees, right? Or we don't hire uh, people of this color. Or we don't hire this religion or we don't. So that's when it has real consequences. No job for you, right? Maybe no life for you. Remember, right on the cusp of, right after Pearl Harbor, we uh, promptly imprisoned uh, several million Japanese, mostly Japanese on the west coast of the United States, right before saying we would never do that. Right before. I see a Japanese intern in Zone 7 out after Pearl Harbor. So, of course, things can move fast in different directions. And this is true around the world. One incident can trigger great... My, my area is Chinese minority policy with this, and I watch it in China around these dispositions. And tough, tough to be a Tibetan or a Uyghur Turk in China. Tough to be a Mongol in China these days. So, so this uh, has this idea. Oh. Uh, does that help out at all? Yes, please. Dr. K, can you talk yeah. about um, how some of the policies that we have specifically in the U.S. around control of women's bodies and criminalization <laughs> of healthcare providers is kind of like vis-a-vis -vis that notion of blood contamination oh, and oh. Uh, institutional racism. Well, game on, my friends, because we didn't see that one coming. I think I can preach to the audience. It didn't see it coming, but it's here. Roe got overturned. We find, of 
course, you've got the what we call the 50 nations of America and 50 states. Why? Because that's where the, the power lies and whether the criminalization will be there or not. So I watch this in the world specifically. So I go into a world of China at a time where I'm just going to say, because I know it to be true, there was a period of coerced abortions. You had to have abortion, single child policy from 1978 till about seven, eight years ago. So, okay, there's one end of the spectrum. The other uh, end of the spectrum, you are pregnant and you're going to have that baby. Whether you want to or not, I don't care if you're 13 year olds and raped by your uncle, you're going to have that baby. So this gets us into the tough sledding of, again, marginal stuff. But in terms of what's going on here today, this has to do with that longer arc. Ben Kiernan out of Yale writes best on this, if anybody wants to write it. It's called Blood and Soil, around the mytholo mythologizing of bloodlines and how that's politicized with no basis in fact, and I mean zero, but it does. And this is why maybe you'd want to read Mein Kampf at some point, because you will see that it makes no sense, but it did to people. So that's the great danger. And that's that great danger around that, uh, you know, this is, no, this is, I don't want to offend anyone, but I'm going to say it, you know, this is God's will for you. And this is how it should always be. And this is the script of blood purity in our lines. So again, it's 2024. I remember a few short years ago, and I'm not alone in this. I work in a big community in the world with this. Part of, you know, people in the thousands. I know some hundreds of them. But we're in a little bit of shock. And maybe some of my older friends are also, hmm, didn't see this coming. Didn't think we'd be in this battle at this time, 2024. Not only here, but in the world right, that these cultural tensions and belief systems, and that's where we go back to our main topic here, xenophobia, where we think in its cleanest definition, it's the irrational fear, because you can ask, make me an argument of why that should be so. So it should be so because it is written in the ages. And you go, well, okay, so or what do you mean written in the ages? Or God's will, or what, okay, so, but then we have a battle, right? We have battle for power and laws and the enforcement of such things. Because if that starts to rule the day, which it has in some parts of the United States, didn't think we'd be here, but we are, that this becomes problematic. And now I'm gonna just again say it, uh, I wanna win. I wanna win. Those battle lines are drawn and I don't wanna lose the battle. But you don't get to win that battle by yourself. So I'm a political guy, and this gets back to that question of how shall we be? So you may think, I'm sure you have some friends or you yourself, I'm apolitical, but I'm going to say that I can demonstrate to you that you live in political systems, whether you're in a hospital or some clinic or at Western Michigan University. These are places with power distribution, choices made that have real consequences for people. Oh, okay. There. Fair? Make me be fair with this and give me my honest best. Um, we're at about the 10 minute mark because I will be fair to you guys on the time. Anybody else, take any direction you wish. Strange, bizarre stuff, Z you know, rational fears versus irrational fears, the other. So, so I lived with, I, I love the primates for instance. I'm up in Rwanda and Congo at times with the mountain gorillas, love that. That's if you're familiar with that region, the ruined Zori Mountains of the Moon, you're welcome to come with me. Pretty cool time to be there. And so you think about hanging out with our primate cousins, right? And I tell you, it is scary at first. And it's pretty wild with a mountain gorilla clan up at 15,000 feet. And you start to reflect on how much we are the same. And yet, how difficult it is for us to find our path Right, so this is the stuff, again, I would say that combination of uh, Benedict Anderson is maybe the go-to person on this in terms of any readings you would do about how we imagine ourselves and how we imagine ourselves becomes part of our belief system, but in a world with tangible rewards of money, guns, housing, freedom to do some things that you think you can do, but somebody gets in your way and says, no, you shall not do that. That's that line, it was stunning, could do nothing about it coming out of Ukraine to see those two lines was telling and you go no please don't do that but they did so two lines you look like this you're over in this line you look like that you're in this line so tough stuff let's see anybody any place go yes have you ever experienced someone in the healthcare like system like refuse to help someone me I can I can go to my, my, my absolutely of course 
Absolutely, of course, sure. Not just once, many, many times. So discrimination exists. This is not necessarily xenophobia, but more kind of the idea of, so I can get into details if you wish on that, but uh, you want some details? Sure. Sure, okay. So if you are, so I taught in India for a while, not to disparage love India, you guys, namaste, ab kasehe, if anybody's here, I do my, Hindi, jana. But uh, the, um, the idea, if you are a Dalit, that's an untouchable in India, and you walk into a clinic, and I walk into a clinic with a minor uh, stomach upset, who's going to rule the day? It's me and my dollars. That Dalit might just be kicked right out. So that happens every day in the world. It happens in America. It happens here. So the predisposition towards socioeconomic variables, these become what we call the markers, right? And those markers may be real or perceived. I perceive you as poor. I perceive you as uneducated. I perceive you as less. I perceive you as less deserving of the skills I have to offer. And of course, this is not unknown. This is known everywhere. Right, so, so we don't want to, you know, I just remember that particularly from India, because from my standpoint, I mean, lucky me, right? American passport, of course, this thing, colonial legacy, racism at work, and you go, but, so there's a specific example, but there are millions happening at this moment. And I would say millions right in your profession around the world. I watch it in uh, Western China is my area, so I watch when Tibetans go into clinics and they're disparaged immediately by the Chinese doctors, because they have, because they, they have horrible, uh, they will perceive them as you know being less. But anyhow, there's devils in the details. By the way, all these are like tip of the iceberg stories. Okay, so oh, and I'm being filmed. Great. So who knows what kind of? Oh, you know, go ahead. Yeah, go. I want to go after Dr. Harrison's point. And you Feel free to stand up and take control. Yeah. Okay. All right. But the, um, please stand. Up. Okay. Yeah. Do. Yeah. No, we can. The other side of abortion is a forced sterilization. Yeah. Women of color, black women in this country. Yeah. The fear of um, uh, you know, contamination of blood. Yeah. Um, I guess but it, it still is a soft coercion. I think. Sure. Sure. Um, you know, you sure. Sure. So may I pick up on that? Because yeah. you know, world guy that I am, right? I'm a yes. Global kid from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. <laughs> but uh, part of our research area in Western China is around forced sterilization that undergoes. So, so this is there are accusations out there which we try to gain some metrics on. Is if you have a minority population, this was true with our own indigenous populations. One of my problems, or people in my group, that often we think this is only here that this only happens here. So I'd like to carry these numbers in my head. This is 4%. Let's go see what's happening in the other 96%. Uh, and it happens everywhere. Sometimes much worse, sometimes a little better, but let's go ahead and look at that too, because those are human beings at work also. So we look at the idea of what's known as genocide by um, lack of you know, demography, is that if I sterilize every young Uyghur woman, and that's Western China, or Tibetan girls, uh, there will be no Tibetans in a generation or two. They will be gone. And then I will not have that problem. And that, of course, is accusation of genocide, and that's, but this is tough to get. Accusations are one thing, facts of the matter are another. China, of course, absolutely uh, um, uh, rejects this notion that that is happening. So we have stories. And we get stories in relative free environment, but then we have to go prove it, right? So that's tough, tough to prove stuff. Yeah, maybe some stuff's easy to prove, her, but uh, does that make sense? Yeah, I forget who asked that question right here. Yeah, we went, let's see, maybe time for one more and then let you loose. Anybody want to take it anywhere in the world? Pick a country of the 206. We can talk about xenophobia anywhere. We follow the threads. It's not just you and me in here. It's a hum part of human condition. And, and beware the metrics. If you Google, I reviewed this um, periodically, but I did this morning early. Uh, we have horrible measurements of, of this. So if you go and just, this is one of the problems of you know, vetting our sources. If you Google, Google for most xenophobic countries in the world, you might see Sweden come up. And you go, 
Yeah, but then you walk into it and you say, well, that's because that's where they're doing the work. So, yeah, so, you know, this is the ease of measurement in such places as opposed to, so we have to be careful about gauging that. And maybe a last word on this to you again, unless somebody wants to, we've got a couple minutes. To, to make, you know, that little question um, below the surface is that if there is a fear present of something, is the fear grounded in anything? Because it's okay to be afraid of the jaguar coming, leaping out to, you know, right? To take your uh, throat or something, that historic kind of arc of why we, it's good to have that adrenaline flow of fear at times. Right? But we are really talking about the political, say, when we talk about xenophobia, and that's our topic here, we're really talking about systems that reinforce irrational fears. It's okay for you to be afraid of things, that's all right. But then you would say, why? And then, you know, that makes sense, right? I would be afraid too. As a, like, should you walk outside naked for an hour right now? No, I think I'll die or have frostbite. And, you know, bad idea. So, so that idea, I don't want to freeze anymore. But the idea of what we're looking here again is, and this takes some, you can see it, right? The feeding of the irrational fears. And by the way, I'm going to say it again. That speech just a couple years ago is the feeding of irrational fears. And that, that really happened. Um, so for me, double down, fight back time. And that informs me even today where I don't want to, I want to go fast with it. I don't have time because uh, anytime somebody talks about purity of bloodlines in 2024, I thought we were done with that, but that just happened. Hey, um, all good? Mm -hmm. uh, feel free to come. We're going to go to either Bangladesh or Tibet this coming May. Thanks for tolerating me. <laughs> have a good day. And I, I love the movie. The movie was great. <laughs> Thank you so much for tolerating me. Oh, gosh. Yeah, fast and furious. All right, go have a good afternoon. Me too. On to the next thing. Rock and roll. What's that? I'm an undeserving wretch, but yes, of course. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you so Here we go. We try to have that as best we can, huh? And it's a tough sledding, though, right? And of course, so easy, as we all know.